today's panel is all about big data solutions. You know, what are the specific pain points, customer problems that are being solved, um, what, how big data is being leveraged in, in the various deployments, uh, what is the market demand for it, and as developers, what are the skill sets um, and tools that you need in order to get a grasp on the big data technologies that are out there. So big data today is really low level and it's really cumbersome. And so the, the mission of my company and I think the future of big data is how do you build abstractions on top of it? How do you make it more consumable by, by kind of the, the official developers? Um, how do you give people an environment, how do you get people user interfaces and tools, plugins, things that make the development of these applications much, much easier. And also, I think the future of big data is going to be around, this is a big part of what we did at Facebook, was unifying batch and real-time stuff. So I'm Josh Bloom, I'm CEO and co-founder of a startup called Wise.io, and we're basically building machine learning as a service to allow developers and data scientists and ultimately enterprise to build real-time insights into big data uh, workflows. I think the important thing, in my view, of, of big data, sort of coming from the astronomy world, I've, I'm a professor at, uh, at Cal, and I've been doing big data before it was called big data. We have you know hundreds of gigabytes of images a night, and we needed to extract lots of insight out of those images. And we wound up realizing that some of the machine learning solutions we were applying were broadly applicable across multiple domains. Um, but our view is that you know big data is just going to wind up being called data pretty soon, and you know the big data economy is just going to be called the economy. Every company is um, either now data driven or going to become data driven, uh, or they'll they just won't survive. I'm Seth Proctor, uh, I'm the chief architect at GoDB, um, which is a company we've been developing a, a relational database that's designed to be cloud scale. Working on the project for about five years. It just went to the GA a few weeks ago. Everyone has a lot of data, and whether you have big data in the sense of a large database, whether you have big data in the sense of you have data that you're doing real analytics over, whether you have big data in the sense of you're trying to do some kind of machine learning to find some patterns or find some meaning, uh, everyone has large data sets. And as you add more and more tools to the problem, it becomes harder and harder. And so, what our company is trying to do is take a so a different approach, which is to say, we'll take the traditional thing that people understand, which is you know, relational asset transactional systems, but we'll provide them in a way that they can do SQL in a traditional sense, like an OLTP type sense, but they can also work in a transactional sense with long running transactions. You can work with large data sets, small data sets, but it's the same kind of theme that, that you just heard these two guys talk about, that like, as you have this increasing complexity, you have different systems coming together, but there needs to be an easier way to think about how you work with all this data in a, in a meaningful way, because you have different applications that are going to work with the same data sets with different goals, and that's a challenge. I'm Jeff Hendry, I'm the CTO of Everscale. Um, I'm not far removed from being a developer. Actually, I'm still a developer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, wrote, I write code for you know uh, dealing with Hadoop and HBase and Amazon Web Services all the time. Um, and one of the first things that um, becomes a pain for developers you know, when they're working with big data in S3 or in HDFS is basically the opacity of it. Um, it's very surprising when people get into working with Hadoop how hard it actually is to find specific values. And anybody who writes code knows that when you're debugging, you know, with your traditional tools, that's what debuggers are for. Setting launches, breakpoints, um, uh, map reduce programs are really, really hard to track down problems in the web doing it in the most old school of ways. Like with System out print one? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. advanced. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, and then you, when you can't find it with system out print line, you, you have to dig into data. And so VertiScale is basically providing summary analysis and you know what pays that query in real time on top of data in HDFS and S3. And when you do that, you basically democratize access to data because you shorten the cycle, I just call it going around the mulberry bush. You come up with a hypothesis about what's in your data, because as these guys said, the, the businesses are being driven by data now, so this isn't about creating bottom line value, so when I say like saving time in order to get to an answer, that's actually top line value for the company, because if you're like an ad targeting company, the faster you, and more accurately you can create segments of your users, the, the, the more you out-compete the other guy who's in the bidding network. 
I mean, for the application developers in the audience, people that are building applications on a day-to-day -day basis, they deal with the abstract layer. Why do they need to know about what's underneath it? I mean, does it matter if it's... What, what abstract layer are you referring to? Well, what I'm saying is, is, is exactly. <laughs> well, uh, on the big data, right? the, the APIs is what you're dealing with at the end of the day. You're, but, you're but, integrating but, various... But I think part of the problem is that, that so the HBase API, the MapReduce API, they're not high-level APIs. They don't abstract the implementation. They are the implementation. The architecture of the system is totally inherent in the API. And they don't understand your data. Right, so, so yeah, like a SQL table, right, models your data. It doesn't model how it's stored necessarily. It can be stored 10 different ways. Right. HBase means you've got to, you model how it's stored. That's what you're storing, right? That's what you do. And so there aren't great abstractions. And there's stuff like Hive and Pig that have come to MapReduce to give people SQL-like interfaces. But those things are very slow. They're not iterative. So you're seeing, seeing things like Impala come up. You're seeing things like what you guys are building. Um, that are giving things more interactive, right? But I think one of the things that's coming to my mind in this discussion is all of these different companies are actually targeting different demographics. So some people are building for data scientists and saying, how do I enable my data scientists to not have to bug my engineers, right? And then how do I get my engineers to not have to bug ops? How do I get ops so they can be on their own, right? And so everyone's building these products for different kind of user segments. Like, we're squarely focused on developers. We don't care about the analysts, we don't care about the data scientists. We want people to build stuff on our platform for those people, right? Whereas other people, you know, want to target these analysts, they want to target the scientists, give them all the tools so they can be self-sufficient. And our vision is, if you want to do that, if you want to build something for a data scientist, if I have an idea for a visualization, for example, or a machine learning algorithm, do I have to stand up to do the niche base to deliver that product? Or can I use the platform build just my core logic on top, and then enable that on top of another platform. So how do you get people to focus on their core business, their core competences, however they're trying to add value, and not have to deal with the enablement, really? Which well, is very much like cloud. Right. Uh, so let me ask, is the, in, in terms of the overall industry and where you see things are headed, I mean, the growth that we're expected in, in the big data space, is it a push model or is it pull? Is it customers asking for big data solutions? You see enterprise customers coming out and saying that you know, they have a need for this. Or is this something that you're, you know, it, it's something that they're considering, especially in the enterprise case. Um, you know, where do you see, if, if you're a developer and you're considering, you know, do I need to get familiar with this or not? Is there a market need? And, and how strong is that market need that you're going after? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I, Seth? So I, I think, the comment earlier about like there's no big data, there's just data. Right? So yesterday there was a, a a great panel discussion about analytics, right? And this was about user analytics. It was about how do you like push out things and understand are people using this right? And the, the common theme that every one of the panel said is we've already heard here, which is like what you should start doing is from day zero you should be collecting as much data as you can because later you're going to want it. And you're going to want it in some form, right? So like it doesn't really matter kind of what level you're talking about. Everyone who's, who's building something today that has to go live should be collecting a lot of data and is collecting a lot of data. And whether that's kind of the traditional thought of like, I'm a bank and I've got a ton of data, or whether it's someone who's saying, I'm pushing out a new UI and I want to understand how people are using it. Like, everyone is collecting a lot of data. And, and those developers may not be thinking of that as a big data problem, but it's a big data problem, right? It's a lot of data that's being collected in some form that maybe today you're not analyzing, but you're going to want to analyze. And when you want to analyze it, you're going to want that data available to you. And so it may be that people start out as big data consumers without thinking of themselves that way, right? They're, what they're really doing is they're just collecting a lot of stuff. And, and as you say, they're thinking about how to store it right now, not how to query it, but they just want to be able to store it. Store it. And then later they may get to the point where they say, oh, okay, now I want to start querying it and asking some questions about it. And now I learn about how to ask more interesting questions. And then the problem becomes, well, how do I get from that I thought about how to store the data to now I can think about how you actually work with it and analyze the data, right? And I think that's where, you know, having systems abstract is whether it's the, the kind of system we're hearing here, whether it's a, a, a UADB like solution where you're putting it into a traditional database that you can then restructure later, you know, having something that gives you that flexibility to store something and later be able to analyze it, it is going to be important for just about everyone, I think. So Josh, on the machine learning side of the house, in terms of the data sets that are available mm -hmm. and, and, you know, what, what are the, what is it that you envision, because you're, I think, a startup still in beta trying to launch the products, what is it that you envision that you would be providing to uh, the big data community in terms of Well, at some, at some level, um, you know, companies that have a big data problem have a specific question they want to ask of that data, 
they have started contacting us and saying, can, can you help us with this? And we say, that's not a machine learning problem, that's a different kind of problem. Or some that say, I don't think we need to talk to you, but here's the types of questions we ask. We say, yes, that's a perfect type of machine. It's a big, huge classification problem, or regression, or a clustering problem. And so I think one of our big challenges is helping you know, everyone throughout the stack of an enterprise understand what can be asked of, of data in, with machine learning, and then making it as easy as possible for them. So I think one of our big challenges as well is kind of lowering the barrier to entry. One of the difficulties is when the data is in all these different formats and you have actually silos of individuals and companies that sort of lord over one database and another one that lords over another type of database. And they're maybe in the same building, but they don't actually know how to join against each other. And you know that the real interesting value is getting those two things talking to each other. And if you could only do that, boy, then you could ask some great questions. One of our difficulties is always going to be how do you how do you make it as easy as possible to get people to essentially get their data in, in a format that you can even ask these questions. So can you ask can I ask you what are the questions that are you're helping to answer in terms of machine learning? What are the questions that in terms of business drivers that you're helping answer as a result of it? So the, so without getting into some of the, the, the details, because it, it, it cuts across a number of domains, think about essentially any problem where you have some visualization, and you typically would want a bunch of people looking at that and say, oh, I see an anomaly in that data. Now I'll flip to the next screen. I see an anomaly there. And you just sort of think of this as this mundane thing, but some of these analysts are maybe trained to you know, find things that are like needle in a haystack that only a really well-trained, well-paid person could do. If it's taking them six months to do this, and now you can just train a machine to look through that same data and find those anomalies and get some sort of guarantees of how well you're doing um, because you can back test, that's a, that's a game changer for companies. And we're seeing that um, in many different industries on time series data, and we're also seeing it um, just on you know customer click data. Um, there's also the, the sort of static corpus data where you have retailers who have, say, hundreds of millions of images and they're really trying to figure out a way to surface the long tail and let their customers not just buy the top selling t-shirts, right, but get at things that are way, way out there and make it as easy as possible for them to do these. So, um, you know, the data is there, the companies are asking these questions, they're saying what can we, what can we learn in our own data and how can we make money off of that? And so that's, that's our, our all, I think all of our biggest challenge is helping companies do that. Great. In terms of the audience here being developers and people building Java apps and mobile apps and what have you, um, what would you say is the most important takeaway in terms of big data trends and that you see over the next two years that you want to make sure that you relate to that? Uh, Jeff? Yeah, well, let me get to that by way of chiming in on the previous question. Sure. I think it will be the answer. Um, I was recently on a panel in New York for UBS's Javits Center. They, they had a convention of Javits just for basically their own bank. Um, and they had a whole day carved out for IT. And you had maybe 300 people there for the big day of the day just from that one company. And I was on a panel like this that was like a three to five times the size. Um, and one of, the, one of the challenges that goes on at banks is you'll hear things like, and this is like, not hyperbole, they have 8,000 Oracle licenses um, <clears throat> for an international bank. And so they have big data problems that are in aggregate big data problems if they could figure out how to treat it as a big data problem. And the problem, right, that, that would actually make their life a lot easier if they could bring all of those silos into one place and be able to ask simple, single questions and have it uh, hit all of the data. And the trend that I'm seeing is basically the new Hive data warehouse, which is, it's sort of the first easy step that an organization like a big bank who's figuring out, what well, should I do machine learning? What the heck should I do? Well, the first thing it's you do, sequence. basically, see, the first thing you do is you just dump all of the data. And it's very safe. If you're putting it into a read-only data warehouse, and by the way, data warehouse software is also insanely expensive. So you use to do a Hive for the data warehouse because it's essentially free. Um, and then once they've crossed that bridge of having a big data problem, then they have a good problem to have because they can actually ask questions all in one place. Yeah, I want to I just add to that last point and Go ahead. answer your question because I think, I think that's exactly right. 
I think another thing that people are starting to become more aware of, I think, is that there's been this, this great hype for a long time about like, you know, no SQL and big data is awesome. And part of it is it's like it's unstructured, it's fabulous. It's just like data, you don't have to worry about how you organize it. Like, doesn't that make our lives easier? Yes, it does, until you go back and you say, now I want to ask a question about it, and you got like this. And you're like, now I have to figure out like what to do with that, right? So I mean I think that the you last yeah. speaking to a bite in HDFS so, file is not very I'm just, I'm just saying that. you might you might want to think up front about you don't have to get everything right, but like, you know, like we've already said, you're not gonna get the first question right, you're not gonna get it right the fourth time, but you're just saying like you want to be able to ask questions. And and in order to be able to ask questions, you know, it might be that you're you, what you really want is structured SQL, we we hope you do. It might be that you want something you can do some learning inference over, it might be there's some other mechanism. Um, you don't need deep, rich, strong, rigid structure up front, but you need to have some structure. You know, unstructured is not the same as no structure, right? And I think a lot of people in the first round of big data were all like, I'm just going to collect enormous massive data, like you said, there are all these different Oracle licenses and other large systems where you're like, where you're like, I don't like that, and I'm just dumping a ton of data into something, and now you're trying to collect things from different sources, and everyone used, you know, different terms, and everyone used different whatever, and different structures, and some people use no structures, and now you're trying to call out of that something. Yeah. And if you don't think about at least a little structure up front uh, that's going to evolve later, <laughs> you're going to be in a lot of trouble when you actually want to ask those questions. I'd like to maybe put something in the positive here, not that we haven't been very uh, excited about the future here, but for the developers in the room, I think you can reasonably believe that there are companies like, like us out there who are going to try to make it as easy as possible for you to, to build your app. And in the context of the stuff that we do, um, think about the kind of magic that you'd love to have happen on, you know, on an iPhone app or an Android app, and say, if I just push, you know, the data I just acquired from, you know, the accelerometer, from from the images that I'm acquiring, over to some magical system, and I could get back something that would just be great. You can start demanding that kind of stuff. And if you're thinking about uh, acquiring a lot of data on just an individual <coughs> user, think of every person as just this walking sensor and all the data that they have. Push that over. There are going to be companies around that are going to be able to ingest all that and help you make sense of it. Um, and if you're not seeing that out there, uh, you should be demanding it um, because that is one of the uh, goals. I think of, uh, in fact, probably one of the themes of this of this whole of this whole week is how do you make it as easy as possible to just use consumable resources that are out there. And you don't have to think about how am I going to store my data. You don't have to think about how am I going to get insight from my data. You know, at the you know, if everyone's building and architecting their APIs well, then it should be as easy as possible for you to do magic with um, with your apps. As a developer, you know, um, what do you think are going to be the key trends that I should be aware of that's going to really, um, you know, keep me ahead when it comes to machine learning, for example? So I think what you're going to wind up seeing is this emphasis on more real time. Um, you know, one of the one of the difficulties of doing machine learning in a sort of a batch distributed system, even if you can do it on large scale, is that you know you're not always sure when the answer is going to come back. And what what you're going to wind up seeing, I think, over time, is innovations that allow um, you know large customers, but then all the way down to the individual developer, to ask a question of a large amount of data and get back an answer, you know, in milliseconds and not you know maybe 24 hours later. So the way that we see our company going is, you know, based on sort of great underlying technologies that make things very, very fast and scalable, is this sort of question we're asking now of, are you even using machine learning in your workflow? It's a yes, no. And then I think in a, several years from now, everyone's going to be using it at some level. Um, and then it, the question is, are you doing it better than the other guy? So if you're doing a dynamic pricing model and you're Amazon and you're Best Buy, and Best Buy is, you know, pinging Amazon's website, and Amazon's pinging Best Buy's website. They're looking at each other's product offerings in real time. They're dynamically changing their pricing models based on what the other guys are saying. If one takes 24 hours to update and the other takes 10 seconds, it's pretty clear who's going to want to win it, right? And so there will be more and more of an emphasis on getting that kind of insight um, very rapidly. So uh, I'd say keep your eye out on that and start figuring out what you can do as a developer to take advantage of, of the kind of real-time aspect to it. Great. Jeff, you know, you go to a bank and they've got 8,000 installs of Oracle database going. I'm sure they have a lot of concerns around e-discovery and privacy policy and you say, hey, let's put all that data into one place and try to make sense of it all. Um, 
I'm curious, within the traditional enterprise, not the folks that are in Silicon Valley building cool apps uh, or the, 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 the technologies that are out here, but within the traditional enterprise companies, what do you see in terms of the barriers for adopting big data? How are you addressing those? So, John, I'm sure this would be of interest to you too, as, as you're building your data fabric and asking people to migrate their data to your infrastructure, how does uh, the concerns around data retention, data discovery policies I mean, I think just are addressed? Even step back a little bit, there's a huge divide I see between the small and medium sized earlier stage companies and the big guys, which is the big guys don't want platforms. They want solutions. They actually don't want to pour their data in and ask a bunch of ad hoc questions because they don't know what the fuck they want to know. So. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, <laughs> our audience is over 18 mostly. Okay, fine. Um, but that's, that's, you know, I have to emphasize that point. They really don't know what they want to do, and they're going through, we call it the trough of disillusionment, right? There was this huge hype cycle. They said, hey, we can write all our data down for free, so let's do that. And now they have this thing, and it took them six months, but they're not getting any value out of it. And when they talk to companies like us, they're like, this is really cool, I can see how this is useful, this is better than what we have. I want applications, I want solutions. I want the, you to tell me, okay, here's how I'm gonna do better targeting on my ad upsells. There's how I'm gonna do high frequency trading or what, whatever their different things, they really want solutions. Okay. And so one of the things I see about big data is it used to be all about the infrastructure, now it's moving towards platforms, and eventually it's gonna be vertical apps. And over time, value accrues at the top. Right, the infrastructure will be commoditized. Right, there's going to be a couple of winners, and this happened in traditional BI. This is going to happen in big data. We're we're in the middle in the middle layer of continuity, trying to enable what we see is the next five years of apps, people building UIs, algorithms, specific vertical applications for health, for sensor networks, for environment, for finance, for all those different things. Then all the enterprise is going to adopt it. Right, and and I think you'll see a ton of uptake when you have. Big data not as here by some infrastructure, but big data as, hey, you guys have these types of signals and you can actually deliver this product with it. And people want to build data products. And people want to actually try and monetize all that stuff. And so I think as developers, if I was a developer today and I wanted to get into big data, I start thinking about what vertical app can I build? What do I know about in my domain expertise that I can scratch some verticals itch, right? I can build a health IT framework or UI or algorithm, something like that. Great. So what are the challenges that you're seeing as you're going into that bank and talking to them about you know, aggregating their data and making sense of it all? Yeah, I mean, just on the, on the specific question about security, I mean, I think that's an interesting one that sort of cuts through a number of issues that make the bigger organizations so different from the smaller organizations. Um, you'll get asked a question like that from somebody at a bank about what your solution is for security. And they will tell you that what they need is a robust security model. Uh, and that that's very important for working with big data. It's a robust security model. You're right, they're not <laughs> auditing. Uh. Right, well, but some, something, something interesting specifically on related to sort of financial services and, and big data and security it did happen uh, recently. I was at the AWS, the, the Amazon reInvent conference, and NASDAQ announced that they're going to have the NASDAQ cloud on Amazon. Basically, they're sort of wrapping that in the various layers of, uh, of audit and, and you know, uh, authorization that give the financial services vertical the check boxes that it needs. So I think you're basically going to see people making wrappers around entire technology stacks for industries, because the, the, the barriers right now are really CTOs with very high level, you know, notions of needing a robust security framework. And it's like you fight fire to fire. You don't fight that by actually trying to create a robust security framework. You fight that by creating a NASDAQ cloud, which has a checkbox on it that says robust security framework. Thank you so much, Jeff, Seth, uh, Josh, and John. Greatly appreciate your time on the panel. Thanks again for taking part.